evening. I've been mulling this over for a long time because this is a long time debate. We've all had the experience now, or we should have, you're not doing it right if you haven't, of being called a Nazi or right wing on social media because of our opposition to the pharmaceutically sponsored men's sexual demands movement. My first time was when a friend who works with young children shared her concerns about the image of a child in a library lying on top of a man. The fact that the man was wearing a dress meant her friends who view themselves as progressive lambasted her and me. Absolutely nothing to do with my left politics, but there I was being called a Nazi. I once opened Facebook and discovered I was on the shit list of a man who styles himself gender critical, very left wing, pro-feminist, pro-Aboriginal rights, the stuff of allies, right? Anyway, I'm now enthralled to the religious right because I have shared information from the American group Women's Liberation Front, Wolf. Is this supposed to stop women making connections with other women, whatever their party politics? One suspects as much. Many of us do fear making connections with other political persuasions, viewing it as antithetical to our own political beliefs and counterproductive to our activism. Some of us, however, seem to me to be caught in the trap Andrea Dworkin described in Right Wing Women. Quote, as Phyllis Chesler and Emily Jane Goodman make clear in Women, Money and Power, women struggle in the manner of Sisyphus to avoid the something worse that can and will always happen to them if they transgress the rigid boundaries of appropriate female behaviour, end quote. Is it then fear of disapproval or staunch strategizing, which keeps us hoping the left will support us in our struggle against gender identity ideology? I find as I read over right-wing women, what's happening now in a major geopolitical shift is that many women's loyalty is now to the new left, which looks a lot like the old right to me. This is about the trans activists, the male stream left loves, while they line up in allegiance to the companies which sell the drugs to support surrogacy and sterilizing children. Capitalism is liberation, choice is the mantra. So I think the landscape of left and right is destabilized nowadays in ways which affect how I feel about any loyalty to party politics while I still hold fast to the importance of class struggle, like any good lefty. To go back to Wolf, I don't believe that women who run Wolf consider themselves right-wing. I don't perceive them as right-wing. It is lazy but effective politicking to make us appear so, since our arguments in favour of women's sovereignty appeal to neither left nor right in politics at present. Are those things called optics what really matter in political campaigning? I also wondered about our definitions in all this. What is the term for appearing on a platform because no one else will have you? As did Julia Beck, weeping on the Heritage Foundation stage about the damage being done to lesbians in her city of Baltimore. Is it a coalition if you agree on only one issue? Is it ally if you agree on an issue? Can we do one issue agreements at all? These terms actually have definitions which can help us describe these choices really well. And I'm happy to share this paper because I've got links and all that kind of stuff. So a coalition is building a separate new organisation from existing groups, like, for instance, Hands Across the Aisle in the US. Building an alliance is two or more groups coming together on an issue but retaining their separate status, not forming a new organisation. Then there is a range of different kinds of coalitions as explored by Sydney Tarot in the new transnational activism. They include, and I can talk about definitions later, but I just want to say there are things called campaign coalitions, federations, instrumental coalitions, or event-based coalitions. And each of those have different levels of involvement and cooperation and agreement between the different groups. So then I wondered, can allying with groups which actively oppose aspects of women's liberation ever be good for women's liberation? According to Nancy Whittier, collaborative adversarial movement relationships emerge when otherwise opposed movements share a position on a specific issue. So is that what we're describing? If we understand exactly what's being sought, would we feel more comfortable with it? Does allying or building coalition with the right solely on this issue have to mean bad things for women? 
Who do we even mean by the right? <coughs> Could we stake a claim and work from a position of power in that space? Collaborative adversarial movements are happening all around us without us even knowing there's a term for it. We can have the same response to an event or a movement without being fueled by the same reasons. We can agree on something innocuous without it implying we agree on an entire raft of policies. I sometimes say things like, Scott from marketing and I agree that the sky is blue when the sky is blue. We see it, we have a broad social agreement that it is so, and it doesn't cast doubt on his politics for him to agree with me about that. How good is it? <laughs> In anti-fracking politics, there are alliances between farmers, a traditionally conservative, even right-wing group, environmentalists, traditionally anything but right-wing, First Nations people, small people, small town um, people, and tourism operators, all together. We know it has locked the gate. All the groups see the benefit of working together. The groups put aside differences such as critiques of colonialism, farming methods, animal husbandry, human eating habits, adherence to daylight saving, and pumpkin scone production. Because saving the family farm and saving the planet have much in common. Fracking smashes the human environment, destroys the ecology, erodes the land, and takes with it the livelihoods and health of farmers. And even though in a colony our relationships to the land may be seen as complex to the left, often farming families have a pride in their longevity on that land. Some of those farmers most certainly temper that with an awareness of land clearing, perhaps even intermarriage with the locals, or shameful secrets of massacres and cruelty. It is clear from the mission statement and guidelines of Lock the Gate that they've been produced by a group discussion, probably by a consensus. It makes me think allying or even coalition across such potentially stark divides is possible. It's a similar mission statement to that of Hands Across the Aisle. We are radical feminists, lesbians, Christians and conservatives that are tabling our ideological differences to stand in solidarity against gender identity legislation because we have come to recognise it as the erasure of our own hard-won civil rights. Our individual members of Lock the Gate feeling disenfranchised or silenced in this <coughs> have the more left members begun espousing or working for far-right causes. From out here, I can't tell. With what they call 120,000 supporters and 450 groups, perhaps there is sufficient <coughs> cultural diversity and representation to allow members to concentrate on their main issue and not get sidelined into their differences. The group seems to think so. Quote, this alliance is bigger than us. There are hundreds of First Nations people in the network fighting for water, culture and country. Farmers are speaking up while also having to face climate change. Tourism operators that are fighting to keep areas pristine and water clear while trying to run a business. Together, LTG and its collaborators have achieved incredible things on a shoestring budget given the scale of these nationwide campaigns. As a feminist, it's a little bit of a giggle to see the group describe themselves as operating on a shoestring budget of $2 million a year. I'm not sure I've seen more than a few grand in any feminist kitty. Even the women's electoral lobby only works on 50 grand, and that's despite their allegiance to the trans movement. But compared with the mining and gas companies they oppose, who have unlimited budgets, it is pretty small, and they are having victory. What can we learn from that? So what material problems, rather than so-called optics, can arise when left-wing feminists ally or form coalition with the right? To continue on the topic of wolf, Elizabeth Hungerford once wrote a really good summing up of problems she perceives as having emerged from wolf, not only working with the right, but taking advice and some funding from them too. Like me, she largely sees a lot of issues on the surface as what we now call optics. But then with legal training under her belt, she suggests that the then latest amicus brief from Wolf isn't based in a sound <coughs> interpretation of what's at stake, but a reading which favours the political beliefs and aims of the right-wing groups with whom Wolf is working. Since I have neither an American legal background nor a useful knowledge of the case or brief, I have no way to effectively form an opinion on this. I note that in feminist groups on Facebook, some other lawyers did not concur with her reading of this. She strongly feels that, quote, as it turns out, one bad thing that could happen when feminists associate very closely with right-wing organisations and individuals is that feminists come to hold out bad legal analysis, echoing right-wing hyperbole as their own, end quote. 
She also feels that feminists supporting these poor interpretations are scaring women and decreasing women's legal literacy around sex-based rights at a time when they need to increase. So far, I haven't noticed any changes in my attitude towards welfare or abortion, despite my newly formed friendships and acquaintances on the right. I'm curious to know if other women have felt their politics altering over time. What does not concern me in this is the neoliberal so-called left not liking what women do with each other. I don't like their promotion of the sex trade, so we're even. <laughs> so I pondered my own experience of working across the aisle and found it pretty lacking, but let's look at it from another angle. Have we been kidding ourselves to think that despite the obvious sexism and even misogyny of the left and prior to the influence of queer theory, that women could make genuine gains from working with and within left spectrum groups. I well remember as a young woman waiting for the now disbanded Builder, Builders Labourers Federation to bring sound equipment for feminist rallies back in the day when a few thousand women would hit the street. I know recently the CFWMEU was fined $50,000 for refusing to work on a site without a designated women's toilet. I also note the rowdy and threatening presence of CFWMEU members at Melbourne IWD a couple of years ago. How they hemmed in radical feminists and protected men who identify as trans with placards threatening violence against us. The Melbourne IWD collective supports this. Is this the collective allying on a single issue to end women's rights with a predominantly male organisation? Are they actually the feminist organisations we hear about which fall to the right? I asked Moira Deeming about this from her perspective as a woman elected to the Victorian Parliament and Liberal politician, as well as someone long interested in working across political lines with other women. I've long been curious to know if women on the right experience the same kinds of attack from men in their political circles as those of us on the left. It's left-wing women who've stuck up for me more often than people on my own side, she said. She added, so very often what I've learnt over the last 15 years is what we actually think of each other's views is so often a horrible caricature and doesn't take into account any sympathies, complexities, struggles that people on either side might have. She would like to see a politics where we are judged on our character and behaviour rather than a political label, which seems logical. A label of left or right doesn't actually suggest anything in terms of integrity. It rather denotes nowadays the extent to which a politician embraces varying kinds of economic policies, and even then there's not a huge divide between the camps. Moira says speaking up has cost her a lot, but is worth it considering what's at stake given the attacks on women and children. From her description of male colleagues' possible responses to her working with the left, it sounded like a probable response to most things she might do as a woman in a party with few women. These included a group of men who have utterly sexist attitudes no matter what, a group who'd support her but because they'd be hoping she'd embrace gender identity with them, and those who'd be a bit in the middle. So I wondered why it is that right-wing political groups are sometimes open to these pairings with left or feminist groups in a way in which most of the left seems to find problematic or even abhorrent. Over here on the feminist left, we have basically very little in terms of actual funds or even social capital. We risk a great deal in every venture. Women famously make no money from feminism and less from activism. We pay for everything out of our own pockets on less money than men earn. We scrimp and make do. We've borrowed resources from larger groups and often had to be very creative to form campaigns or produce events. Perhaps we're then more cautious about spending energy and taking risks by working with larger groups who don't share our ethos more broadly than this one issue. Does the right, feeling confident and actually aware that their resources and reach are so much greater, take that risk knowing it's less likely to come back and bite them in their well filled asses? Does the right value the end over the means? Is it that we don't deny the humanity or bodily autonomy of members of these groups while they seek to deny us the right to be lesbians or terminate pregnancies? Can we ally with people who think we should be controlled? Is it that we have so little to spare in pursuit of justice that we hold on to ethics we hope somehow translate into meaningful change without a net loss to us? Roughly speaking, we've got nothing but our pride and we won't compromise that for charity. Do we fear the ally will be confirmed in their view of the trope of lazy left-wing poverty if we accept their support? Could the spirit of our work, though, still shine through if we actually succeed in beating back the trans activists in a legislative sense in coalition. 
Nancy Whittier's fascinating work on the coalition of anti-pornography feminists and right-wing groups in the 1980s was very clarifying to me. It is incredibly important for us to know that coalition can happen and can work across really profound differences without harming either group. We are not the only group struggling with these issues. Quote, collaborative adversarial movements converge around a number of other significant issues, including women's suffrage, environmentalism, prison reform, civil liberties, same-sex marriage, anti-globalisation, human trafficking, crime victimisation, and other issues, end quote. The other incredibly useful source is the Oslo Centre, and I find it really exciting to consider the work they're supporting. If groups on either side of literal civil war can find common ground to move past a shared threat, can women make a positive choice to work with surprising allies and defend our sex-based rights? You might remember the left-right alliances between those in Australia who were working on marriage equality. I don't recall anyone ever calling them that. I just want to include one last example of alliances, so we're going to play a guessing game. Who is this New South Wales politician? In the early 1980s, he played a key role in cementing Aboriginal land rights in the state. In 2012, he introduced a bill removing the so-called gay panic defence from the Crimes Act. He recently cast the deciding vote in passing a bill banning intensive puppy farming. He has voted against a Liberal government bill that would have made it easier for farmers to cut down koala habitat across the state. He gave his support to a series of Greens amendments to a bill recognising LGBTIQ plus and disability rights. Last year, he very publicly stood with MP Alex Greenwich, the infamous author of our Woman Free Abortion Act, and soon to bring us the weasel words of another anti-conversion therapy bill to strengthen protections for Aboriginal heritage and culture. You have one guess. Who is it? It's Fred Nuff. Oh. The Reverend Fred Nuff. Oh. Right. Yeah. <laughs> MP Emma Hurst from the Pro Trans Animal Justice Party said, When I was elected to Parliament, I said we've got an open door policy and they were happy to talk to anybody about issues. And Fred Nile was, I guess, one of the few MPs on the right who was open to that. There's a lot of people in this building who have caused a lot of people pain. That's always going to be hard to deal with. But at the same time, we've got to be able to work with everybody. That's the job. So in conclusion, I think we would all benefit from reading materials from the Oslo Centre. They brought together groups like uh, the Hutus and Tutsis of the Rwandan Civil War to form government together. People who literally harmed one another in the street. Uh, they were instrumental in helping the Chileans move past uh, when Pinochet was deposed. Again, people who tortured, able to form a coalition. So there are basically five pillars for building and working with effective coalitions in their free resources. Um, and I could go through these, but am I very close to time? Yeah, okay. So there's five pillars. You can ask me about that. <laughs> it's a concluding paragraph. I began reading and writing all this, feeling very conflicted and on the fence about managing a coalition or even a loose alliance with groups that have very different belief systems from my own. As I've read more about the theory and seen the disparate groups able to work together, I've begun to feel more optimistic about concrete ways to organise and manage. Given the understandable caution in women's groups, I suggest transparency and accountability are vital to any attempts at coalition. I also think if we knew more about processes and possibilities around how to build coalitions, what they mean, what they don't mean, that we could more confidently negotiate potential pitfalls. I know it's been taught from the trenches, as it were, without wider knowledge or detachment that fueled how I originally felt about it. On a final final note, and alliances, etc. aside, I think many of us just really need to get over the fear of being labelled right wing. Mm -hmm. If transphobe is water off a duck's back to you, then make it your next mission to make all of you so. We can't actually control how others see us. We can only act with integrity as we do the work and know that we are doing our best. We can also act with integrity towards other women in the struggle since this struggle is probably the largest we've ever faced and a broad church seems a necessity. If you don't like a woman's campaigning, don't join in her campaign. Make your own. 
God is, knows we need every kind of campaign we can get, and viewpoint diversity is vital to this. I know I'm off the left, and it makes me laugh to see people try and silence me in this way. The thing is, if it wasn't this way, it would be another way. Right wing, old, irrelevant, ugly, unfuckable, bigoted, turf, take your pick. Lesbian. Lesbian. Hopefully right wing has a criticism aimed at us by a left which supports the sex trade and the sterilisation of minors will cease to have any power over you too. Thank you. <laughs>